Welcome, everybody. Let's get a quick show of hands. How many people here are football fans? Hi, how are you? That was quick. We're just coming to the good part. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they'll be back. Um, I figured we were all football fans here. How many people are here are 49ers fans? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. 49ers yeah. fans are here. So you'll get some intimate feedback from your fans. I'm the only one with 49ers colors on, I think. There's gold. Close. Okay, close. close. <laughs> red red close. and gold. That's good. His wife wouldn't let him wear a 49ers shirt. <laughs> All right, so when we talk about innovation in the NFL, we don't typically, it's typically about on-field innovation, like new types of blitz packages or the pistol formation, which the 49ers know a little bit about. Um, the fan experience really hasn't evolved that much over time. Uh, and in fact, when you talk about technology and the fan experience, you know, if you go to a football game, you're lucky if you can get service on your cell phone or like even send a text or anything. So into this, environment. Now we have the 49ers building a new stadium, or really the city of Santa Clara is building a new stadium with a lot of input from the 49ers who are going to be the, the main tenant of that stadium. Um, $1.2 billion stadium that is going to, if they can deliver it, transform the fan experience for people at football games, 49ers fans. Um, and to talk about this, we have Jed York, who's the CEO of the 49ers, and his family has owned the team for, for decades now. We have Gideon Yu, who's the president of the 49ers and formerly CFO of Facebook and YouTube. And Doug Garland, who's the general manager of Stadium Experience and Technology and has a long uh, career in tech coming out of uh, mobile phone technology and Yahoo and Shazam. Yep. Um, so let me start with you, Jed. Um, your family and and the, and the franchise has been working on building a new stadium for many, many years now. And you told me that when you came to work with the team in 2005, you had two main goals. One was winning another Super Bowl, which you were very close to doing last year, just a few yards away, and getting this new stadium built that you've been trying to do for a long time. And the idea for a long time was to do it close to your old stadium, Candlestick, and, and now it's, and then it moved to Santa Clara. So maybe you could just explain to us, as you were thinking about building a new stadium, why, you know, why should it be a leap forward in technology? What, you know, just what was your vision for the stadium? If you're not only going to get it built, but, you know, have these audacious goals for what to do with the stadium. Well, I mean, anytime you're spending $1.2 billion on something, you want to make sure that it lasts. And I think that's what I've seen with a lot of stadiums that have been built. They haven't, they haven't taken into account what's coming forward. And, you know, when we've done our research and going around to see anything that's being built, baseball, basketball, arenas, soccer stadiums. You know, there was an example of a stadium in the mid to late 90s uh, that decided at the last minute they needed to run cable throughout so you can plug in your laptop anywhere in the stadium. Mm -hmm. And you know, you look at those types of things and that's just not the right answer. We sat down with a group from Silicon Valley and very early on and nobody can really identify like this is, this is the one thing that you need to do you know, th this is the type of technology that you need to build out, or this is the hardware that you need. The only thing that was unanimous was that you can't have enough Wi-Fi capabilities. And I think building off of the last panel, listening to Philippe, you know, it's not about hardware. I don't, I don't really care what hardware people use. I want to make sure that the content in the stadium is what you want it to be. And when you have 70,000 people coming to a venue, you don't want to have one great experience for 70,000 people. You want to have 70,000 unique experiences in one venue. And I think that's what we're trying to build out because right now the couch is, it's such a great option. You need to be able to bring people to the stadium and give them an experience inside of a stadium that they can't get anywhere else in the world. And you know, that was really the goal. One thing I'd add to this is, you know, I, I think I recognize a lot of guys in the audience. Uh, in order to do something in, that, that, that seems impossible, if not very difficult in the industry that you're in, uh, you, know, you need really strong vision. You need somebody who's, who, who has an unyielding vision. You need somebody who makes bold decisions. Um, and what I'll tell you is that, look, I, I've gotten lucky enough to be around some, uh, uh, some of the greats in Silicon Valley. You know, I've worked for Zuckerberg. I've worked for Chad Hurley, Steve Chen. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say that as far as uh, taking this, uh, this hill, and, and going up against some, some really difficult problems. And, and almost an industry that doesn't, is not built to solve this problem, you, know, you really need to have a great visionary. And, and you know, I, I'd say that not many people in Silicon Valley um, you know, see sports as a bastion of innovation, but, uh, 
but you know, this team being led by Jed is, is, is really one of those bastions. So you've buttered up the boss now a little bit. <laughs> I'm good so, at that. So just so you know, yeah. he, he doesn't bonus? even have an employment contract. <laughs> so we still have to, to go it. back. He refused to sign it. So. <laughs> uh, He's still trying. But Gideon, and I was going to ask you, I mean, I, this is actually a good transition because you have worked with these teams and for these kinds of people. And uh, maybe, I mean, I think people would like to hear how you came from that world, those jobs to the 49ers, what was appealing about this project for you? And then, you know, you're hardly the only uh, Silicon Valley veteran at the organization now. You've, you've helped put together this team. So what was exciting to you about coming in? And when you were coming in, um, you know, Jed was working on doing the financing to try to make this a reality. What was the vision that you saw from Jed? And then, you know, what did you want to build? Well, first, maximum uh, props to uh, Daniel Lurie, who's uh, Jed and I are both on his charity board of Tipping Points, and uh, he introduced the two of us. Um, and what I'll tell you is that the short flip answer for me is that it was kind of an early midlife crisis, right? It, it was, um, I've had a good run in technology, a good run you know, working in my career, uh, but for me, you know, I grew up in Tennessee, and, and it was, to me, it was all about football, and even within football, it was all about the 49 And we've talked about this as a terrible accident of your birth that you grew up in Tennessee instead of Alabama. Instead of Alabama. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, where, where SEC rivalries will come out to Aspen as well, I guess. Yeah. Although it's not a rivalry anymore between us and you guys. But, uh, You'll be back someday. Um, but what I'll tell you, Hopefully though, is, far in the future. What, what I'll tell you, though, is, is that, that the longer answer is, uh, you know, I feel like my entire career, especially the stuff that I've been doing in Silicon Valley, leads up to this. This is at its core, not a stadium project. This is not a financial issue. This is not a real estate issue, although it is at, at, at some level all of these. What this is is taking a blank piece of paper and trying to think through how do you fundamentally rethink the user experience. And that's a uniquely Silicon Valley problem. You think about it over the last you know, five years versus the five years before that, you know, it used to be all about the great engineering. Now it's all about uh, the great user experience, the great user interface, the designers are now uh, the ones that are in uh, uh, big demand. So, so, so for me, that's why I came over here. This is, one, this is a problem that is super difficult but not impossible, and that gets me super excited, especially given that you know, I think that I'm fan number one. I, I get to build an experience in this new stadium, this $1.2 billion stadium for myself. And you know, hopefully that extends to everybody else. You guys have a good time with it as well. But uh, you know, a, as a consumer and a huge fan of football and live sports in general, what an incredible opportunity that is. Um, Doug, you, when we were talking the other day, you said that this was the, uh, I think you said it was the most interesting project you've ever worked on in technology. Yes. Echoing what Gideon was, Gideon was just saying. And, and you were telling me about um, your experience at Shazam sort of in, in a weird way prepared you for this or was a precursor to this challenge. So maybe, I just thought that was interesting. You might want to share that with people. And in a minute, we're going to look at some more pretty pictures of the stadium and talk about some of the specific technology uh, that they're working on. But Absolutely. So, uh, you know, when I got the call from Gideon, who's a wonderful man and a great boss. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, nice. Uh, nice. anyway. Um, and anybody uh, that knows Gideon knows that he, he's full of it right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he told me about what they wanted to do in the stadium. Uh, and we've talked about it at a high level. We'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. But basically redefine the fan experience. And at the time, I was with Shazam. Hopefully, most of you in the audience have used Shazam. We're very popular. We, they uh, are a very popular mobile app where you can identify music playing on a radio. Uh, and it's become one of the top, most downloaded apps of all time. Um, we work heavily at Shazam, we did work heavily at Shazam with the music industry. And one of the things that I would find often coming up with musical acts and tour promoters was, well, this is great that you're working with us on the radio, but for us, we want to engage fans during concerts as well. So what can we do that's creative together? Um, how can somebody Shazam us during a concert and get an experience that's unique to the live performance? And oh, by the way, and not coincidentally, also allow us to monetize those fans by selling more merchandise, which is very important, or doing other creative things. And we would come up with really interesting experiences that we might do, but we could never find a venue that was suitable. Uh, and so typically, it starts with the fundamentals, which is, for, and everybody knows this, Wi-Fi coverage, despite many teams' best efforts, or just is not enough. 
and we need to be connected. And so without connectivity, it began to fail from there. But I heard from these entertainers that they wanted to do something. And so when Gideon called and said, we want to do this in sports, it was interestingly, I, I mean, it was immediately appealing because what I'd heard at Shazam, and also as a fan, it's just something I wanted as well. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I think it's important to emphasize how how much of a failure most stadiums are providing this service. I mean, I think, you know, maybe the Super Bowl. But they're not Bowl, even trying to provide the service. Yeah, well, it's, and a lot of people have just assumed that you can't do it, right? right. So um, let's take a break, and we'll kind of scoot to the side here a little bit. And um, I guess we need to get up and just move the chair. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry. Um, and let's, let's maybe just kind of walk through moves. some of these. I think it's taped or something. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, so that's good in case of an earthquake. Um, yep. so, so why don't we just kind of walk through these slides, and you can tell us quickly. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is obviously a rendering of what the stadium is going to look like in all its glory, but maybe sort of talk about the general design of the stadium and you know, some of the, how you're implementing the technology. And then we'll talk about what that technology is going to enable. So um, uh, yeah, what we wanted to do is just give you a little bit more of a, uh, uh, you know, a feeling for what we're trying to do in the stadium. And so Jed and Gideon are really the experts on the physical plant. We've got something here from a technology standpoint. But you know, the first thing you notice, obviously, about the stadium, an open fan experience, very airy, very inviting uh, to fans. And of course, for those of you from the Silicon Valley area, you can see we're located right in the heart. Go to the next slide. Um, you know, Jed Gideon, I don't know if you want to talk about some of the background, but... Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I think the key was when, when you look at this structure, you have the majority of your suites built in one area of the stadium. That's not typical. Usually you build suites in two rings all the way around. You have a mezzanine level for your club seats. Those are the most expensive seats in the house, and they're not right on the field. They're one or two levels removed, and they have, you know, special access to better food, and you pay... 5x the price for that seat. And it just didn't seem to make sense to us that the people that aren't sitting closest to the field should be paying the most amount of money just because you have, you know, a micro brew and, you know, a, a gourmet hot dog instead of, you know, just your regular hot dog. So what we wanted to do is say, let's, let's put the majority of our people in this suite tower, bring the upper deck over here lower and closer to the field, take the mezzanine out and put your club seats closer to the field where the best seats in the house are. It just seems reasonable and, and rational that you'd want the best seats to actually be the best seats and the most expensive seats. So when you look at the fan experience, you've got two thirds of your bowl, of the lower bowl, of the people in the lower bowl, which brings people lower and closer to the field. That's about the most you know, dynamic thing that people have done in sports by actually bringing people that are paying more money lower and closer to the field. And that seemed like a pretty low bar for us to step over. So what we wanted to do from there was say, OK, how do we get more tech friendly? How do we get more green? How do we make sure that it's functional and not just for tech or green's sake? So you can see the solar panels on top of the, on the roof. You can see the green roof here. Because of the way we've designed the building, we'll actually be net neutral to the grid for our 10 home games. And no other stadium in North America can say that. There's only one stadium in the world, and I believe it's in China, that can do that right now. And then really the next step is, how do you connect to your fans, especially in Northern California, where technology is just, it's commonplace. Everybody is familiar with technology. It's probably the most adopted use of, of smartphones, of tablets, et cetera. So if that's the case, and, and Gideon is fan number one, I don't know where that puts me, but <laughs> apparently Gideon is fan number one. What we wanted to do is say, how do we make sure that everybody can connect? How do you order a hot dog in your seat, a beer, a soda, things that are normal? You know, again, you're thinking about competing with the couch. You're, you're listening to Joe Buck and Troy Aikman when you're at home. How do you connect to that while you're actually at the game? And that's really where, you know, Doug comes in because of this stadium. I mean, same number of seats as Candlestick, about two and a half times the size of Candlestick. So you have a lot of space and you have a lot of ways to connect from, from a fan standpoint, but it's really the next step. How do you make that easier and do it in a way that's not beating you over the head with technology, but it's something that you can opt into. And, and that's really what the next step is. So I, uh, I want to quickly point out that that roof is green because it's got grass on it. It does. Well, cool. you know, <laughs> on that note, thank you, Jed. Uh, 
just going to the next slide, we're going to have the Grand Concourse area. And as Jed was just talking about, this is how most of the fans order today. Now, you can see that we don't show many lines here, but that despite the best efforts by everybody in professional sports, we all know. You get in a line, you have to decide, at what point in the game do I want to go down to the concourse and have to miss something? Uh, and um, I missed Barry Bond's 700th home run that way, as a matter of fact, being the guy who drove the short straw, and I got beers for everybody, uh, and watch it on TV from the stadium. Uh, but um, So we've got great concourses and great physical spaces, but still we could do better. Go to the next slide. Obviously, luxury areas. Next slide. And Brian on that rooftop terrace, because I know that's where you're going to hang out. We've got a rooftop terrace. Great physical plan. But if you take a step back and think about it, as Jed was saying, as Gideon was saying, when you look at a stadium, there's a different view you can take. You want to go to the next slide? So a cut out of the stadium. Really, what's behind a lot of the stadium are a myriad of unconnected, often archaic software systems. So first item, um, access and ticketing. We all know about going paperless with ticketing. What makes all that happen? Software systems, by the way, which typically are siloed. Next, point of sale systems. You buy something at a concession stand or a merchandise stand. We all know, we probably have uh, been to sessions here about mobile payments and all that great stuff. These are software systems often developed, by the way, by partners of ours, and we'll continue to partner, but they weren't thinking about that in-seat fan experience. Software. Next, people make a lot about displays, and we put them everywhere we can. We put up TVs, and a lot of people think that's advanced tech. Well, we're going to have that. They're all programmable. You can do things like change menus on a concession stand or keep up to date on the game. Um, they're software driven, as are next, the big boards that you're going to see. We got a big board like everybody else. Um, but Not like everybody else. This is going to be the biggest outdoor. That's what I meant. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you how great Jed is? Uh, so, um, so uh, and by the way, something that not everybody has next is we're going to have a video, con we're going to have a content production, a studio right there producing content. Again, all driven by lots of different software systems. But the problem with all of these is, because, is when you look at it, it's, this is how they operate today. Silos, not connected. So we're going to change that. And that's going to allow us to do some interesting things. Next item. First of all, we're going to be distributing that video through a sophisticated content distribution system. And of course, to do that, next item, we're building a network all around the stadium. High bandwidth network all around the stadium that's going to connect all these systems. That's going to make it interesting. Because now what we can do is we can put together, and I don't have a uh, visual representation of this, but a back-end software stack that taps in to all of these systems. The point of sale where you're ordering hot dog, or maybe buying a 49er jersey. The video displays. The content that's being produced here, where the video replays get cut. So we're going to have a back-end software stack that integrates with all those, and we're working with all our various partners in these areas, quite frankly, trying to bring them into the new millennium when it comes to APIs, because these guys weren't thinking about that. And what that will do, once we've got it connected and we've got a back-end software stack, is you can begin to connect to mobile devices. Of course, if you're paying attention, you know there's one thing else we need, a little Wi-Fi coverage. Um, so we're very fortunate to come along now because as we all know, Wi-Fi now is so much better than it was three, four, five years ago. We're using the five gigahertz band, not just the 2.4. And these access points are becoming so sophisticated, they remind me of the cellular systems that I helped build in the 90s. They're that sophisticated, and we're lucky. And that allows us to put density, a high-density Wi-Fi in that is unparalleled in the industry. And once we have that in there, you can connect. And what can you do? Next item you can connect to your mobile device. And we can do a lot of interesting things. You're accustomed to seeing video footage on your mobile device. What you're not accustomed to is being able to see replays on demand from your seat in the stadium. You hope maybe it goes up on the big board. It might or it might not. And by the way, if it goes up on the big board, you can watch it once, but not two or three times like you might want to do. You and can not get from different angles. And not right. And, and that's the key when you're talking about content you want different camera angles. You've got 16 camera angles for just any normal NFL game. We'll have other cameras. We'll be able to have field cameras. We'll be able to have field content. So you're going to have a better content situation for a 49ers game here than watching on your screen that's this large at home and watching Monday Night Football or watching Sunday Night Football or watching the best broadcast that you can possibly have. Yeah, and, and so you'll be able to do that because that's what you talk to fans. It's like, oh, man, I hate giving up the replays. 
By the way, the other thing that fans might have given up is that, that commentary that you do get, whether it's on radio or broadcast. We're going to bring that in uh, as well, so you'll be able to listen to it in your seat. That's just for in-game. But all the way, back to hot dogs. Uh, so we've got this great game content experience, and there's much more we're doing there. But what we're going to allow every fan to do from their seat uh, is order the food they want and have it delivered to you in seat. As I was talking to somebody at lunch, we, you know, we're going to be the Uber of hot dogs, I guess. Uh, so um, you'll be able to get that to your seat. Um, and that way you won't have to miss that game. By the way, if you want to order express pickup because you want to get up and walk around, you can do that too, and we'll let you do that. Um, and needless to say, Colin Kaepernick runs a touchdown. You get excited about this guy. You want to learn more about him. Boom, you push right there. We'll tell you more about him. Probably give you an opportunity to buy his jersey too and have that delivered to your seat or express pickup too. So we'll be able to do that. And other things that I'm not going to show you here, including wayfinding around the stadium and a lot of other cool things, that once you've gotten these systems, talking to a back end so that you can integrate and a sophisticated set of APIs the way your developers would do it now, you can do all these things. One other very important point, uh, and then we'll kind of leave the slides alone uh, next is once we're bringing all that together, not only can we present it to consumers, hit it again, enterprises. So as Jed and Gideon have told me, the state of the art in managing teams, or, or quite frankly, managing the customer base in a, in a programmatic way is like dark ages. And that's because you didn't really have access to this information. That's what we're going to be able to do. So teams are really going to be up their game in terms of relating to customers and managing the team. So one thing I'd add here, though, is that, that my guess is that given the audience, usually when we talk to sports audiences, this, is, this gets gasps, this gets, this gets like high fives. <laughs> Everybody in this audience is like, well, of course, you need to have a platform that talks to everything else in integration. <laughs> um, but what I'll tell you, though, is that, that as we were building this out, as we were trying to envision how to do this, um, things as basic as having your CRM system interact with your payment system, with your ticketing system. You know, th these, are, these are revolutionary concepts in sports, and more importantly, they're, they're, they're revolutionary when it comes to you know, the, the hundreds of software systems that are, that are, that are going on in the system. And so, so if you think about it from enterprise software parlance, this is you know, a, a, a fundamentally different ERP solution that has 70,000 concurrent users, each with their own different and unique uh, user experience. Um, and so to do that, 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 is, you know, that, that ranks up there with the you know, multi-million dollar ERP Oracle people soft, whatever, you know, deployments that you see out there. And what we're trying to do is this. If we build that, one, it makes it much more efficient for them to talk to each other. It, you know, Todd, it's just similar to when you were over at, at FedEx. You know, when, when FedEx was, was, was envisioned, they needed to create the entire thing, the entire backbone, the entire infrastructure before they sent their first package. This is the same way here. You can't have a situation where I know you, Jeff, are, you know, a, a, a fan of this, that, and the other. You order this kind of food and you want to have it delivered to your seat. I can't do that without having a back-end system that has ERP, CRM, all the other acronyms all tied together in, in a way. Also, to then take it forward, whatever the next new thing is, whether that be a new payment system, whether that be a new type of interaction socially, whether that be the new Twitter or whatever else like that, you can't add new modules on in the future, or you can't open this up to developers to innovate in the future without having this platform approach. And again, platform approaches are are basic. They're, they're almost in the water in Silicon Valley. Uh, and the great thing for us is that you know, we're the team of Silicon Valley. So we brought in you know, the best and brightest people like Doug, other engineers that we brought in to build this platform approach. And if we do it correctly, you know, for the entrepreneurs in the room, if we do it correctly, you know, this is something that should and hopefully will be you know, exported and sold to uh, other stadiums. Well, it's, uh, it's like let's, just about anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's Here. like anything else in Silicon Valley, though, where that's, that's where most things are innovated in our country and, and in the world. And our fans are going to be the first adopters of anything like this. And if it works, it will certainly export to other stadiums and other experiences in this country and around the world. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about the, the, the connectivity you need to have to make this happen. But to be the, the uh, you know, to be able to deliver hot dog to anybody in the stadium, it's not just you got to have the Wi-Fi connection. you got to have people organized. you got to, I mean, like, That's right. so can you walk us through, I mean, like, when you, when you start 
with the blank piece of paper and you have pie in the sky, like, yeah, everybody should be able to order anything from anywhere, like, then how daunting is it when you start, like, you know, getting to, oh, yeah, there's this detail and this detail. I mean, like, what's, how, do you, how are you tackling that? Well, well, think about it. I mean, you have beer vendors. You have guys that walk up and down the rows, and it's, you know, do you want a hot dog? Do you want a beer? Okay, I'll pass you this down, and you can pass me over $20 through six people, and, you know, but do I get to keep the change or not? Oh, five, <laughs> you know. I mean, you, you have people that are already there. They're just not working as efficiently as they can be. And I think that's where you need to work with the entire system of the building and figure out, okay, how do we get these people that are walking up and down? I don't know if you want a beer or if you want a beer, but I, I, I've got a bunch of beers right now. If I now know this is my pattern and I'm going to go deliver beers, I'm going to go deliver hot dogs, it's, I mean, it's simple math to figure out how many people do you need to actually deliver the amount of food, beverages, et cetera, to make all of your customers happy. And for those I hate who, to lose the guy who can throw the peanuts to the exact right seat, though, like, you know, 20. He can still do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, and to bring it closer to home for everybody in the room, um, uh, rolling out an ERP system, uh, rolling out a CRM system, Salesforce, Oracle, or any of these kind of systems, it, it's much less about the software. It's much more about the process engineering that you do. Yeah. It's much more about how you integrate that into... Uh, you know, your daily activities. Because if you don't fully integrate that into your daily activities, then what you end up having is just basically an Excel spreadsheet on steroids. For us, then, it is in-seat delivery. If you think about it, the technology part of that is fairly trivial. It's not difficult at all. What it is, though, is how do you mobilize a, a force of n number of runners without that turning into midtown Manhattan at, at rush hour, where they're just basically just runners all over the place, and you can't actually find your way through that. And then how do you actually then come up with some realistic times, kind of like Uber, and say, hey, I'm going to order this, you know, this hot dog and this beer to my seat you know, in the cheap seats. Um, and then for us to be able to tell you, hey, given all the runners and where they are, we can tell you that it'll be there in 35 minutes or 15 minutes. You know, the, these are logistical problems. These are managing hundreds of hourly wage earner problems. This is not a technology problem. But at, at its abstract level, this is a user experience delivery mechanism for us. Yeah, and so in some cases, technology can help that, uh, and we're using that. And we're very fortunate to be kind of part of the 49ers team here because we can sit down with the guys who've been doing stadium operations for 20 years who know this, and they'll be able to say, yeah, that's a good idea, but that is not going to work uh, for me at this particular point. But they're great, and we sit down and figure out what the right solution is. We'll be able to keep track of those runners, and you know, they will, uh, they have brought up all these operational process issues, some of which is just going to take good management, some of which we can help with technology. You mentioned, you know, that what no one has is the robust Wi-Fi that really works and that, that we're, you know, that you're fortunate that you're building this at a time where Wi-Fi technology has progressed. But can you just kind of like boil it down for somebody who doesn't really know why that's the case? Like what, why has it not worked and why are you guys going to be able to solve that problem? So... Um, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, the way I'd talk about that a little bit, and this is, you know, for those of you who, who are Wi-Fi experts or hardcore double E engineers, my apologies to you because you'll probably say I'm not getting this exactly right, but I think it's something along the lines of this. Going back to, I'll use uh, an analogy to the cellular days. There were mobile phones before there were cellular phones. And typically the way it was done is somebody would put a great big antenna in the middle of a city and there would be phones that are put in cars. And some spectrum band was used off of one antenna. And if you had 12 channels on that spectrum band, there were 12 people that could be on that phone at that time. Where cellular came in is they started figuring out that, well, wait a minute. We don't have to broadcast all over the stadium. We can broadcast in a smaller geographic area if we power down the cells and we make them a little shorter. Well, when you started doing that, you could allow what was called frequency reuse very, uh, so that you could get 12 guys on every one cell, but then you had to have some electronics in the background that would coordinate activity among cells so you didn't interfere with each other, do things like allow for handoffs, and you had to have sophisticated antenna design so you could know where your signal was going so your signals weren't stomping all over each other. And that's where the term cellular comes from. They were cells, basically. Kind of at a very macro level, that's kind of what's going on in Wi-Fi today. 
Uh, you can be smarter about how you design Wi-Fi systems in terms of where that radio energy goes. You can be smarter about how you manage them with these increasingly sophisticated access points. And by the way, speaking of spectrum, which you know wireless guys talk about all the time, we're fortunate that we're not just in the 2.4 gigahertz band, but we're in the 5 gig band as well, which has a lot of channels. So some of it's just more spectrum real estate. Some of it's just getting a lot smarter about how Wi-Fi works. So my apologies to the RF designers and telecom engineers, but that's a loose way to think about you know, it. Take a step back here, though, if I may. Um, it's important to, to, to outline what we do or what we intend to do and what we don't intend to do. So, so I, I think that, that from the Niners' perspective, uh, we're going to do two things, and hopefully really well. One is we're going to integrate together through the platform that we're going to be building uh, disparate software systems. We're not going to go, go and make those software systems. So when we talk about ERP, CRM, when we talk about Wi-Fi, you know, we will work with the best guys out there and not reinvent those wheels. It's the integration of all of them together that we're going to, that we're going to do. Number, number two, uh, integrate and innovate really on the front end user experience. So how do all these software systems, how do all these disparate processes, how do they actually work together to, to fuse into the user experience in a way that it's not tech for tech's sake, but it's just actually a great user experience that regardless of whether it's technology or software or people, it's all one and the same. So when we talk about Wi-Fi, it's not that the Niners are creating a new Wi-Fi system. It is that we're working with great guys out there, making sure that, that's, that, that, that it solves the problems that we're trying to uh, uh, achieve. Right. And that it functions to its fullest capabilities. And that's really what we want. You know, people are here with, with their iPads, their, their smartphones, et cetera, et cetera. We just want you to be able to do the same thing that you're doing here in a football stadium. And if you're doing it here, right now you might accept it in a football stadium that you can't. In five years, I don't think that's going to be the case. So, you know, Doug talked a little bit about, you know, different revenue potentials, which is great. I look at this more of, a defensive play because I don't want people to not come to a stadium because they'd rather be at home. And I think when you do it well, right. then you will see revenue potential on top of that and you're gonna see a complete shift in in-game sports and entertainment experience. And look, we're all from the Valley. I mean, if, if, if we've learned anything over the past you know, five to seven years, it is you know, build a great product, great user experience, revenues will typically follow that. So you haven't modeled out how much uh, you think your revenues will increase Per, of course we have. Of course we have. <laughs> <laughs> of course we have. Okay. We have, but, you know, I mean, if you've read anything about our stadium, you know, our, our ticket prices aren't, you know, inexpensive. Our suite prices are not inexpensive. People expect to get the best if they're paying a significant amount of money. So, I mean, at the beginning is you want to just service your fans from the start. And the things that we'll be able to do day one are very different than the things that we're going to do a year, two years, three years after this is open. We want to make sure that the platform is built and the baseline is set. And then we're going to see where the users take everything that we're doing. I want to make sure we have a chance to open it up for some questions. If there's any season ticket holders, you didn't get the seat you wanted, you could ask Jed. Or, uh, so we have, it looks like we have a few. Um, right here, and then we'll go here. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Kevin McKenzie. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Westfield Shopping Center. Huh? Uh, and uh, I like you there. guys. Yeah, I lived in the Bay Area for 40 years, and I'm so excited again <laughs> to be a 49er fan. So I'll start with that. But, uh, but um, so we're 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 rolling out Wi-Fi in 105 centers around the world, um, and I think I'd love to get your thoughts on when you've created this footprint and this technology. How, how have you kind of thought about the future with regards to Wi-Fi? I mean, I don't know kind of what you're building for. You're obviously thinking about the number of users yeah. you're going to serve, the number of concurrent sessions yes. you're going to host, and the number of... Um, and the bandwidth. And the bandwidth megabits yep. per second you want to uh, allocate. But what about, the? F I mean, the future? I mean, I've had so many carriers uh, and even venture capitalists tell me Wi-Fi is going away, uh, we'll never see the light of day. Um, and um, carriers especially are fighting hard to convince us, you know, Stop. Because it's all about 4G or LTE yeah, it, or the next or, iteration. Or we heard once before YMAX. Uh, and yeah. so I'm just curious how yeah. you guys thought about both serving when you launch, but also building an infrastructure for as far in the future we'll as, you, as you can. Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, or you so, want to take it? Go ahead. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, great question. This, this really is the crux of why we went to 
building the entire tech stack instead of just connectivity? Because the, the analogy is this. If you remember back to when you went, that, that, that magical moment when you went from dial-up to broadband, suddenly for a couple of days, it was like the whole world has changed. You're like, oh my gosh, I can actually like get these speeds now and, and, and my life is gonna be so much better. And then what you realize after a couple of days of getting used to that is, okay, now what? Now what services, what products will I actually get to uh, deliver to me? And I think that in venues, especially yours as well as ours, um, connectivity is something that needs to happen. But once you get that, it's then gonna be, how do you actually interact with place? You know, how do you actually have augmentation of your experience there? in a way that's really deep and not just tech for tech's sake. And for us, it is thinking through all the things we just talked about, whether it's you know, faster entry into the stadium, whether that's in-seat delivery, whether that's just a loyalty or rewards program. If you don't have these things, then people will build that for you. And at the end of the day, you know your venue as well as anybody else does, if not better. It's up to all of us to make sure that we create smart venues where the mobile devices that are in those venues over the Wi-Fi actually interact with our venue and actually augment their experience. If you do that, I think that, again, whatever the motive may be, whether it's for revenue or not, uh, that will provide some significant uplift because you'll have a better experience. You'll stay there longer. So you don't think there's a things. chance you're betting on the wrong technology that two years from now, all this stuff that you're building and putting together that's really cool is going to be out of date because... The point about that, though, is that we're not betting on technology. We're building a platform such that we can plug anything into it. Yeah, and, that, and that's the key point. That's absolutely key, because you see a lot of teams now that are saying, well, we're just going to spend money on Wi-Fi, and we're going to get better Wi-Fi capabilities. So you, know, you, you can now get your mobile app here, and you know, it's an app solution. It, it's not. It's, I mean, when you're in a venue, whether it's a mall, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with malls from, from my family's background, <laughs> or a football stadium, or any other stadium, I mean, it, it all has to be integrated and all has to be connected. And that's, that's the key. Right. Yeah. And, you know, if the cellular systems get there, uh, we're okay we're with customers with getting uh, bandwidth from every, anywhere they can. Did you talk about a stat about, uh, I, you know, displays and thinking about investing in displays versus leveraging consumer investment? Well, so, any Cowboys fans? So, so Jerry Jones spent close to $70 million on his scoreboard. It's a great scoreboard if you've been there, you know, the Super Bowl there was awesome when we went, and I mean, it's really, really cool. But it's a very macro approach. Everybody gets to watch the scoreboard and whatever is, is on that. Our fans are going to spend about $1,000 every 18 months in Northern California on, on new technology, whether it's a tablet, a smartphone, whatever else is coming out. That number almost sounds low to me. And, and it, it very well could be. Yeah. But it, I mean, essentially, we're building one of Jerry's scoreboards every 18 months but we're not spending the, the money. The capital is all being spent by our fans. And that's really what we're looking at. Instead of putting something hardware into our building, you know, we want to we want to be out of hardware. We want to make sure that all the people that do hardware very, very well and have billions and billions of dollars on their balance sheets to actually go spend on RD, let them go discover something and let our fans purchase whatever they choose to purchase. We just want to make sure that everything functions to its fullest capabilities in the stadium. We had a question in the back, and then we have another over here, too. But why don't you identify yourself and go ahead? Sure. I'm Amy Webb. I'm the head of Web Media Group. We're a digital strategy agency. And I may be the only person in the room who was wearing purple last January. Um, My mom, <laughs> that's her favorite color. But, you know, <laughs> it's all right. It's not her favorite team. It's good for Mardi Gras. Yeah. So, um, so a lot of, for, the, for a lot of people, the game day experience begins the moment that they get into their car, not the moment that they walk through the, the turnstile. So I was wondering, in looking at the stadium, which looks awesome, um, have you thought about extending the, the geofence to outside so that the experience doesn't start once the consumer walks through, but maybe, you know, that, that ex because what we're really talking about is a different user experience. So does the user experience that you're talking about really um, happen once folks get inside, or, or is, is it going to start maybe once they get into their car? Because and, and, there's a whole bunch of stuff running up to the point where they, they walk through it, right? So there are two answers to that. First, absolutely, like it starts when you get into your car and you, know, you wanna know where's their traffic, where's the best parking, where, you know, what's going on, where are my ticket upgrades, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's absolutely gonna be a part of what we're doing, but we can't, we can't take any of the content that happens inside of the stadium and take it outside just based on the NFL. So I can't rebroadcast Fox or CBS and everything that we're doing internally 
and then sell that to somebody that's not actually inside the stadium. So those are sort of two different things, but what you're saying is yes, and it's, it's very hard for us to sell this to anybody other than the 70,000 people that are coming to a game. I have an NFL question. I mean, the NFL gave you guys a large loan to help you get going with the construction. Um, but what about the other owners? What kind of feedback or uh, you know, input do you get from them? Are they, are they excited that you're you know, building this thing and raising the bar for them? Or are they a little like annoyed that now that you're, you know, your stadium is going to make theirs look a little shabby by comparison? Or you know, in all honesty, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody really, unless you go to the Silicon Valley a, a fair amount and, and understand it, I, people don't really grasp it. Mm -hmm. And I think first and foremost, it's we're building a stadium that fits our unique customer set. But again, our unique customer set is the one that's setting the bar in everything yep. for everyone around the world. So I don't know that a lot of people... You know, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, the Cleveland Browns or the Pittsburgh Steelers. I was right in the middle of both those fan bases. Mm -hmm. You know, they might say, well, you know, we don't have the same type of mobile, you know, adoption rate as, as Silicon Valley, so we don't really care. We don't need that. In five or ten years, I don't okay. think that's going to be the case. Right. So I think Silicon Valley is a little bit farther ahead of the curve, but the curve is going to catch up. And the, the venues, it's not like we're going to be building billion-dollar venues every year. Right. You know, I think you're going to have to to go back and, and, and fans, and they're going to expect it. And I don't know that everybody really realizes that throughout all of sports. Right. We have a mic over here. Um. She asked my question. Oh, OK. Hi, All right, we'll Shane go here Osborne. and then over here. Sorry. Shane Osborne, uh, USA. I, I have a question. So this device here, I've got it charging today, and I barely used it. Last night, I had to charge two people's phones out of my bag. So I didn't hear it addressed. But if all this media is being pumped into an iPhone uh, and I still got to get home after the game, uh, how am I going to keep this thing charged? Are y'all going to address that issue you in need the stadium? To, you need to call Tim Cook. I don't have his number. <laughs> Are you going to have charging? Go ahead, my man. <laughs> We're laughing because this is a debate internally about, you know, I, I think early on I was opting for um, putting, you know, an AC outlet behind every seat. Um, what, what we found quickly was that the infrastructure to do that, um, you know, is, is $50, $75, $100 million to do. Uh, what, here's what, here's what you're, you'll, you'll get from us what on day What does that matter? One. You're spending $1.2 billion. What's another yeah, $75? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jed, you got, you got to <laughs> but, but then the functionality <laughs> of that is, you know, usually an AC adapter in an airport or something like that, you don't have guys with beers dumping them. So, I mean, it, yeah. I don't know how functional it's going to be. Yeah, so so, so you, you have to find ways throughout the entire building right. to, to be able to plug in, to be able to do things, and also you know, bet on batteries being better in the future. What you'll get from us on day one is this. Um, for, uh, we've all been in airports where we see those charging stations. Uh, we'll have uh, a lot of those all throughout the concourse. Uh, and they'll be in places where you know, if you get a beer or you get some hot dogs or whatever, you can stand there, watch, watch a screen, and charge your phone a little bit. Um, also, we'll have whatever the technology of that day is, whether it's, you have a Mophie over there? No, it's a power bank. Or what, whatever they may be, uh, we'll have those for purchase or for rent uh, for, for all, of our, uh, all of our folks. And then over time, if we get to the point where uh, these solutions aren't adequate and, and you, know, you, you end up sacrificing your consumption of our, of our product, then you know, more drastic measures may be taken. But I think that that for now will cover yeah, We've got a good chunk of it. I'm sorry. Just a key point is yeah. betting on technology, though. That's a big thing that I think we're doing. And certainly from my experience at Google when I was there, that was something that we would repeat to ourselves. Where do we think technology is going to go? And let's bet on that trend. I bet battery life is going to get longer. Let's try to squeeze in one last question. We're running out of time. Yeah, but Hank Adams from Sport Vision. Jed, you talked about competing with the living room you know, to get fans out to the stadium, which I know is a concern for, for every team in the league, and that you're building a production facility and you're going to give a lot of highlights. But can you talk a little bit more about how you're going to compete with the production values of a national broadcast, you know, provider and advanced stats and all Great these question. projects coming down the pike that are going to lead to a lot of potential content? How are you guys going to build content around So I think first you're, you're using the content that's already being created in your venue. So you, you have all the content that's available to the networks off the bat. So if you want to watch any of those 16 cameras, we'll be able to feed to any of those cameras. So that's, that's the basic point. 
the, the person that we've hired to run production was at NFL Films, has ran production at several NFL teams, and, and he's very good at building that out. And it's really figuring out, you know, it's almost like the Olympics type approach, where when you're watching the Olympics, you're, you're watching not just because it's your countrymen, and you're watching the entire story. You're watching the skier that broke his back five years ago. He's back on the slopes. You, you know his family, you know his story, and you kind of forget what country he's from, but you just love the story. We have guys that are so just charismatic, and I'll, I'll give you one example, Vernon Davis. Vernon Davis grew up with his grandmother in Washington, D.C. You know, not a very good area, you know, very tough upbringing, and he's a Pro Bowl tight end in the National Football League. That in itself is amazing. He's also an artist. You know, he's also an entrepreneur. So starting to build out that content and that technology that we can build 365 days a year, we'll be able to work on all of that. So when you come in, Vernon catches a touchdown. Not only can you just order a Vernon jersey, but if you're there with four different people, I'm guessing that your wife and your son and your daughter probably have a different thing pop into their head when they think of Vernon Davis. We want to make sure that we can satisfy anything that comes to your mind and show you content from all of those things. And we'll be able to build that out throughout 365 days. And, and I think you, you see that there's going to be a ton of content available beyond just what's already there that's already being broadcast that you see 1 16th of when you're watching a game at home. So, so we're absolutely do everything outside of game day, but inside of game day, you know, if you just want to watch Vernon, we can have a camera that's just on Vernon. If you want to teach your son or daughter, you know, this is the right blocking technique for the offensive line, here's the offensive line cam. If you just want to watch Colin Kaepernick, and I don't think that the technology is good enough right now, but I think you'll get to a point where you have a helmet cam. You know, so if you want to watch Colin drop back and watch his progression, that's I, I'm betting that you know, Fox and CBS and NBC and ESPN are working on that right now. We'll be able to have that inside of, of, of our app and everything that we're doing. So it's, it's really building out all of that together and letting you choose your content, not us choose it for you or a network choose it for you. All right. That's great. You can see the passion of the owner, which is great. <laughs> but we're going to have to wrap it up because not only are we out of time, but they have to get back to building this technology platform because they only have a little over a year before they're ready to kick it off in the new stadium. Join me in thanking uh, Jed and Gideon and Doug. Thanks for coming.